Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. Thanks especially to Dr. Nathan Gonzalez, who is in from uh, the Smiley Library in Redlands, um, also from the, the Lincoln Shrine. We're going to hear more about that in just a second. This is the first in, uh, in a series of events that we're going to do called uh, 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 Careers for Historians or Careers for History Majors. We're going to do at least eight of these over the coming um, the coming eight uh, to 10 weeks, we're, we're maybe going to keep going with a couple extra ones with a few to add on. I will send you all the link again that I've shared once um, to the, the, the Google Doc that outlines these events. I'm also going to be sharing um, links as uh, Professor, as Dr. Gonzalez asked me to, if you guys need uh, uh, to see those links and follow up with this exciting work. I'm really excited about this first event. Um, and I want to thank, of course, Dr. Nathan Gonzalez for joining us, but also I want to thank our guest host, moderator, uh, Matt Patino, oh, moderator. A student in this seminar. So thank you, Matt, for putting this uh, together. Please uh, 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 join me in welcoming uh, Matt Patino and uh, Dr. Nathan Gonzalez for a great event. I'll be standing by, but I'm going to turn the floor over to you guys. Thank you, Matt. All right. So, Dr. Nathan Gonzalez is the head archivist in charge of the Special Collections Division at the AK Smiley Public Library in Redlands. Dr. Gonzalez also oversees the Lincoln Memorial Shrine, as Dr. Murray mentioned, and serves as a member of the Redlands Historic Preservation Committee. Most recently, he was elected to the San Bernardino Community College District Board of Trustees, and somehow still manages to find the time to teach as part of the adjunct faculty at the University of Redlands. That's where I met him. I am his favorite student ever. Please nod your head. <laughs> Dr. Gonzalez earned his BA in history from the University of the Pacific and his MA and PhDs in public history, correct? Yeah, from, I'm one of my major fields. Okay, yeah. from UC Riverside. The floor is yours, Dr. G. Cool. Thank you, Matt. Absolutely my favorite student, of course. You, you neglected to mention you spent an entire summer with us uh, at Smiley Library as a paid intern. So that was pretty cool. That was fun. Great. So I, when I, after I got the great invitation from, from Matt and um, Dr. Murray, I wanted to think about what were the things that I wish I had known as an undergraduate? <laughs> because I, I didn't intend to end up in the world of public history. I mean, it's not like I was a kid and I thought, you know what, I want to be a public historian when I grow up. Um, I had somehow thought that my career trajectory would, would be a high school history teacher. And that's sort of where I thought I was going to end up all the way through high school. I'm, I'm one of those few people who actually declared uh, my major as a freshman, like on entering, and graduated with that major. So I, I think there's probably, what is it like, most students anymore change their major two and a half times or something like that. Yeah. So I actually started out as a history major, finished as a history major. And I had finished all the requirements for my major by the end of my junior year. So I thought, well, this is perfect. I can get a jump on teaching credential school of ed classes as a senior. And so I enrolled in a couple of classes through the University of Pacific School of Education. And I made it about two and a half weeks before I realized that this was absolutely not going to be what I grow up. Um, <laughs> just it was not going to be for me. It was a completely different world. And suddenly now I had to figure out what I was going to do when I grow up. Uh, in the meantime, I picked up a minor in music because I suddenly had all this free <laughs> time and I needed to, to fill out, you know, at least 12 units. Um, so I picked up a minor in music my senior year and started to figure out what I was going to do to avoid getting into the real world. Because the real world is a frightening place, um, I think, especially if you're a history major and you have no idea what you're going to do now that your entire worldview uh, has changed. So I started looking at graduate programs around and, and one of my one of the faculty in the history department said, um, there's this program at UC Riverside you might want to think about. And because I, I didn't want to be like a college professor. I was like, that was not going to be my trajectory. That was going to be like way too much work. Um, so he said, look at this UC Riverside program. It 
they call it the program historic resources management. And in the 90s, public history was not an academic discipline. Um, and most departments of history at colleges and universities across the country did not acknowledge, to the best of my knowledge, the existence of the field of public history because the academy is set up to perpetuate the academy. Um, so there weren't programs, really. I mean, there were some, but not a lot. So the one in Riverside was the only one, I think, in California at the time. I want to say Cal State Sacramento picked up a program shortly thereafter or somewhere around that time. Um, but I, I wanted to come back to Southern California. I grew up in Southern California. I guess I should mention that I'm a California person, <laughs> born in Glendale. Um, my my mom's fam my mom and her family all grew up in Pomona. My dad's parents grew up in San Bernardino. Uh, he grew up, my dad grew up in LA. So we're Southern California um, back several generations. Any rate, so I want to come back to Southern California. And I applied for this program at UCR and a program at University College London. Because I thought, well, why not aim high, right? Uh, I came down and, and talked to a member of the faculty and the, gra the graduate faculty at that time. Um, this would have been in the spring of 97. And uh, thought, okay, this is worth applying to and applied. And as it turned out, there were so few students who were applied that year that they offered me a fellowship. Because, I mean, I was an okay student as an undergraduate, but I wasn't, I didn't graduate with honors, which annoyed me because I, finished with a 3.49 GPA. Um, you know, it's always that one class that if it had been just a little bit different, it would have been that one hundredth of a point and I would have graduated at least with honors. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so I got into the program. They offered me a stipend uh, in addition to the fellowship. And I thought, well, I might as well go to graduate school. <laughs> And at that time, their program had three tracks that you could go into. So it was administered through the Department of History, and it was a, an MA in history, but with these emphases. So it was um, archives, museums, and historic preservation. Those were the three tracks they were offering. And I thought, oh, museums, that sounds kind of cool. I got to learn, I'll go learn about museums while I'm avoiding going into the real world. And the two years that I was there, they did not offer the museum course at all. So fortunately, I ended up, um, the first class I had was their, uh, the archives program course, which was uh, one quarter in instruction, lecture instruction, um, seminar, and then one quarter practicum. And then there were, each track basically worked kind of like that. And then you took regular history classes, um, materials classes. I'm not sure what you guys call what you guys call them here, right? Readings, right? So re these are all the most important books about the 19th century. These are the most important books about the 20th, those kinds of things. So they called them materials courses at UCR. So you had to do all of those as well. Um, so it gave a good historiographical background for coming into this. So I ended up in the archives track uh, and I took the historic preservation track as well. And they were both pretty interesting. I'm I'm not like an OCD organizer, which a lot of archivists tend to be um, because it's really useful if you're going to be organizing mounds of stuff. That's I'm, I'm not quite to that place, but I, I do understand how it all works and I can do it all and I can teach it. <laughs> um, so I got into that course or that series of courses, finished my first year and into my second year then trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I think it was probably winter quarter of 99. Uh, and I had taken uh, the practicum, practical experience course in archives at Smiley Library in Redlands because the library director was the graduate faculty member who taught the class. So it worked out very well for for us and for the library, because he got all this free labor. Um, so he was also my um, my thesis advisor. And one evening I was working on some stuff with the thesis at having a meeting and he said, oh, by the way, um, we're hiring a, a part-time person for the archives. 
here's the flyer you should think about applying for this job and at that point my my idea was that I was going to finish my MA and then move to the Bay Area because I knew a lot of people up there so that was going to be my plan I was it was not to end up in Redlands but one of the things that I have learned over time is to recognize opportunities when they present themselves and take advantage of them as best you can. Because opportunities show up and if you're not paying attention, they pass you by. And if I had not been flexible in what my potential future could be, I don't know, I, I probably would be, you know, paying $3,000 a month and eating top ramen every meal. Um, for you know anyway so got applied for that job by a miracle I was selected as the as the new part-time person and in the meantime then I finished the MA I was at the same time working part-time at a new history project that was a partnership between the Riverside Public Library and the then named Riverside Municipal Museum uh, and they called it Riverside Local History Resource Center. So the, the idea was to take the archival collections of both institutions and merge them into a single research place. So you would go one stop research shopping for Riverside history. Turns out it didn't end up long after I left, it failed. <laughs> and that's something we can certainly talk about later is some of the politics of how these things work. Um, but I left that project because then I was offered a full-time position at Smiley Library. So I started there as what they called it at the time, associate archivist and associate curator of the Lincoln Shrine. And I guess I should mention that the, the history division at Smiley Library, the Division of Special Collections, um, consists of all the kinds of research materials you can think of related to the history of Redlands, the San Bernardino Valley, Southern California, and the West. <laughs> we cast a pretty broad net. Uh, and that's books, pamphlets, periodicals, maps, photographs, um, architectural drawings, three-dimensional artifacts. I'm sure did I mentioned pamphlets. I mean, Matt got to work with all that stuff. Um, anyway, pretty, pretty broad net. But in addition to all of those things, then we operate this Lincoln and Civil War Museum called the Lincoln Memorial Shrine. And that is an exhibition space in addition to all of the research collections. And we've had, you know, James McPherson's used our collections, which is pretty cool. So we've had people of all levels. One of the things that I really like about being embedded in a research arm of a public institution is that all of our things are accessible to anyone who wants to use them. Um, there are fantastic Civil War collections in Southern California that unfortunately, probably Dr. Murray and I are the only two who are allowed to see them um, at the present time until everyone else finishes their graduate degrees, right? Pretty exclusive that way. You know, not everyone's getting into Huntington, but everyone can come. Undergraduates can come and do primary source research uh, in our institution. And that's one of the things that I really, really like about the, it's the making history accessible kind of thing. So that that's, I'm kind of, I know I'm jumping around a lot on the career trajectory bit, right? Okay. So the, we had three full-time staff people for a six day a week operation. <laughs> At one point we had four and then there were budget, you know, things happening. And eventually then the, the library director who had been my thesis advisor. Uh, oh, I guess I should back up. In, 2004, I went to an alumni event for the UCR program, and by this point, they had changed it to have created uh, a major field for the PhD in public history. Ooh. I feel like we shouldn't be interrupting that. Oh. Cool. The then director of the program, uh, Cliff Trapser, who if you if people in the class have studied um, Native American history, specifically related in some Southern California stuff, Cliff is likely one of the authors he read. And Cliff pulled me aside and said, hey, we've created this new major field. Uh, you should you should come back and do your PhD. And I said, Cliff, I got a full-time job. 
I like what I'm doing. Um, why would I want to go back and get a PhD? And he basically <laughs> said, well, I'll, I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. So then I was sort of intrigued. Um, so I, we met and he walked me through the process and all of that. And uh, I thought, okay, well, why not? You know, I, what's another three years of my life uh, while I'm working full time? <laughs> and um, so I did. And I started in the fall of 2004. And here's another one of those kind of recognizing opportunities that when they present themselves, not every graduate advisor would probably support this. But Cliff said, why reinvent the wheel? I had published my uh, two quarter research seminar paper um, from my MA. And he said, why reinvent the wheel? You already have written a chapter of your dissertation. So I said, oh, I really hadn't thought about that. Then I had to kind of figure out, okay, well, what else could I build that, that works with that theme? Um, and also, I wasn't studying modern Europe. I didn't have to go to Europe. I studied Southern California. <laughs> I didn't have to go very far. That's pretty, you know, I was with it. So started off, I'd already had a chapter written in my dissertation. I mean, it took a little bit of work, but, you know, reworking. Uh, and then I had another two quarter research seminar. I geared that paper toward my dissertation topic. Um, there was another class that needed a paper and I geared that paper towards my dissertation topic. And by the end of the first year, I had four chapters written. And I'd finished then all my coursework. Um, so it was really worked out really well. I meant to spent the next year um, finishing up the other chapters, did the oral exam and passed that and finished it up and ended up, people don't believe this or they think something's wrong. I finished my PhD in two years. It's funny you applied to University College London because that's a sort of that's a sort of British style of doing it that you did. That's where the MA is so separate. That's really good. Cool. Yeah. So not not very many, I think, in, in the end. It's just I just had to be really smart and strategic about all of the work I was doing for courses and making sure that it all aligned for my dissertation. And then it worked out really, really well. I didn't actually expect that that was going to happen. Even into that year, that second year, I didn't think that would, didn't occur to me that that could happen. And then Cliff kept pushing me, you know, rewrite this. Da, 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 and suddenly he's like, submit this draft. I'm like, okay. And then there we were. So that was cool. So, so I finished my PhD by um, summer of June of 2006. In the meantime, for me, working at Smiley Library and in Redlands, and not everyone's personality is like this, but be, being in a small town, small-ish town, you know, 70,000 people, my work, professional life, and my personal life are not separable. Um, unless I go out of town. Because when you have so few people in a very, we are a very high profile um, institution and the history division in particular is high profile uh, in a town like ours. I can't go to the grocery store without seeing people. And I've also be, made sure to get embedded with a lot of the history aligned organizations in town. So I came in that first year, I moved to Redlands in, when I moved, I moved there in the summer of 99, I immediately joined the board of the Redlands Area Historical Society. And I was on that board, including serving as its president for eight years, maybe. Um, did all, well, you know, program chair, all that kind of stuff. And then we were starting a, a museum. There will, there will be a museum of Redlands uh, that I hope will open either the end of this year or the beginning of 24. And our division is coordinating all of that. Uh, but the organization to, to create it started in 2000. So I was in at the ground floor of that. Uh, when I was promoted the beginning of 2013 to the position of head of special collections uh, and curator of the Lincoln Shrine, as part of, this is silly, I don't think this happens in most other cities. It is in the municipal code for the city of Redlands that the archivist 
or designee um, serves as a member of the Historic and Scenic Preservation Commission for the City of Redlands. And that's the organization that um, administers the historic preservation program and um, you know, approves permits and designates landmarks, that kind of thing. Um, if there's a meeting on Thursday. Um, so all of that then is, you know, it touches a lot of people, not physically, um, not like that. Um, but right, you interact with a lot of people. That's probably a better way to, to do it. So there, there is no separation for me between professional and, and personal existence, um, which I, I think I prefer. I don't, someone said to me once, you know, you guys have all heard that um, cliche, you know, do you want to be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? Um, I've realized that I'm very much a big fish in a small pond personality. Um, just because, I, for me, it ends up with more meaning, right? But Redlands is this cool place because it has a really strong historical um, understanding of itself. And that perception within the community is evolving uh, as the way that we understand history evolves. So as you might imagine, you know, when the historical society started in the early 1970s, it was all about rich white people who lived in mansions, right? And that's probably true of most kind of town historical kind of things. And fortunately, especially in the last 20 years, 23 years, 24 years, um, we have evolved to try to be more inclusive, to document more fully, um, to generate better understanding of all of the different parts that make a community work. Um, and we've got, we made a pretty concerted effort. I, a couple of years ago, I started uh, what we're calling the Redlands Community History Initiative, and that was to encourage any member of the community to submit photos, um, uh, reflections, family history information, any of that kind of thing, so that we can document that. Because if we don't document the stuff, then it doesn't happen. And what do historians have to draw from in the future if the material is not there? Right. Um, that's an exciting thing. I think because of COVID, it hasn't really caught on. Someone else told me that we named it wrong because it sounds too like antiseptic. Um, so we're thinking about rebranding the program, make it more accessible. Um, I, that's been kind of a long-winded thing. So maybe we should open this up to be more conversational. This and is great. Yeah, it, this is a really great start, Nathan. And um, I, I've got a lot of notes here. We, we've done uh, many of these sessions over the last, or I've, I've helped do uh, a bunch of these sessions over the last uh, 10 years or so called the Future History Teachers Information Panels. Talk about bad branding. That, that the future history also is a sci-fi term that I didn't really catch on to right away, but I think it's kind of neat to leave it as that. But anyway, we, we did a lot of these sort of things with um, undergrads who are interested in history teaching. And I'm excited about this one because it's expanding our, um, our sort of offerings and our outreach to, to neighboring communities, but also because you, you may know, we do have a track, public and oral history track, um, at this institution, which which is quite distinctive and and is a lot of energy around it, with uh, Professor Long, Tom Long, uh, and also um, Daisy Ocampo, who's a recent hire in our program, but also Michael Carp out at Palm Desert, um, and uh, Diana Johnson and and Mark Robinson, and my uh, my colleague and my boss, who is who is in here, <laughs> hey Ryan, uh, Ryan Keating, <laughs> who I should make a co-host so that he can uh, jump in if he wants to. Um, but, but it's it's really exciting to hear this. And the, the one thing that struck me was that a couple of the sort of what I wish I had known kind of um, uh, 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 pearls of wisdom that, that I was getting here is quite similar to some of the things that, that teachers, uh, that, that current um, thriving teachers bring back to our students. One of which is to um, follow outstanding mentors, find, find really wonderful mentors in your grad studies, like Professor Clifford Trapser, uh, who, who we know about here. Um, also, 
to 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 find to, to to be on the lookout and to be attuned to opportunities and be ready to 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 jump at them when you when you're sure that they're good ones be ready to move um also even within the the, the seeming rigidity of the teaching field to recognize that there's a level of fluidity and there's a there's a possibility for carving out your own space, which it sounded to me like you were in the process of doing, along with an excellent mentor like Professor Travser. Um, and so that's another really exciting thing. And I want to um, I want to urge um, urge all of uh, the grad students, but also the undergrads, to to take note of that. Uh, it's a really exciting idea that when you combine those things, that is looking out for opportunity, but also being attuned to when it's appropriate to carve out your own space. When you're, you're supposed, I'm a teacher of Chinese history, so I have this sort of good Confucian student uh, part of, of my studies. But then also, you know, so you want to be that good Confucian student, but you also want to be ready to carve out your own space and take up your own space. Um, and we talk about that in our grad seminar a little bit because so much of the, the modes of doing history and as you said, this sort of academic reproduction of academic history that we're up against is, is due, is always due, every generation, every year, every moment is due for a reckoning, is due for, for um, a sort of uh, a boxing match and to say, you know, do you really stand by these things? And, and the second half of tonight's uh, seminar, after we wrap up here, is going to be a discussion of the way of, of historiography and the way these things are renegotiated. So I, it's really exciting. Um, and there are definitely uh, um, a lot of a lot of similar lessons to 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 the stories that we hear from working teachers, and that is to be to be attuned to those sort of things. Obviously, work 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 diligently at what you're doing, um, and also be tuned into those opportunities, tuned into those moments of of sort of professional. Um, Maybe fluidity, I guess you could say, with this opportunity for you to carve out your own your own space. That's uh, really really exciting. Um, so have your plans, but also be tuned into the opportunities. Uh, work hard, but also be tuned into uh, tuned into to guidance and that kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, it gets back to this biggest question of all about what is history? Who gets to say what history is? That's really exciting, and that's so much of what these guys are doing. Um, what, what what we're all doing, sort of, who gets to say what what history is, and and uh, sort of what's what's not history. Um, uh, I always love to point out that, and maybe you guys have already hit this, but the largest employer of historians in the United States is the National Park Service. Yeah. Um, there's there's a huge number of jobs. There. We were, we were actually we were set to have the chief historian come out to Redlands two weeks ago until unfortunately uh, COVID reared its ugly head in Washington D.C. and so that didn't happen. Um, but yeah, there is a chief historian, um, and then they've got thousands and thousands of, of historians because they have so many sites to interpret, and how those sites are interpreted has changed a lot over over time. I would love to have a conversation with someone. In the National Park Service, about how interpretations of Civil War sites has changing and negotiating that space. That's exciting. I do want to note um, that we have coming up um, next week uh, a, a discussion with some state park and historic sites folks. Oh, cool. Um, and so that's going to include um, uh, uh, Teresa Pope and Blythe Wilson, who are going to be in talking about California state parks, and then also uh, a CSUSB alumna. Renee Slider, who's going to be coming in from Wyoming, working at the Territorial Prison State Park, uh, State Historic Site there. So we do have some 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 great folks coming in on uh, to talk about state, and I'm sure a lot of overlap in terms of national historic site, state historic site. But but indeed, um, that's that's a that's an exciting. There's so many neat, oh, not concentric, but what do you call them? The sort of Venn diagrams of historical interest where where these overlaps are. Um, very cool. Thank you, Nathan. And and Matt, you're going to jump in. Please, uh, please uh, go ahead. So I have a question um, to, to kind of move along uh, with the topic. Uh, what is the difference between being an archivist and just being an antique collector? <laughs> uh, the ability to interpret. I would say that's the having, having the historical background to understand 
what it is you're dealing with and how it can be interpretive and how historians are going to make use of it. I think that's very different than than the, an antiquarian or a kind of collector mentality because they're looking at different, completely different things. And I will say I I am admittedly I'm biased because in the archives world generally people are trained in one of two ways. One is first as an historian, and the other is through like a library and information science school. And there, there are benefits to, to both ways as points of entry in, into the archives profession. But I'm, I'm biased, as you might imagine, toward the history because context is the most important part of understanding. Anyone can learn how to, to this is going to sound, I, I better think carefully about how I say this. <laughs> Systems of organization are, are important technical skills to have, but the ability to contextualize and analyze those materials is different than that. And that's what historians can bring to the archives profession. And and it sounds it sounds I mean really really exciting. There's so much that you said that's that's exciting. I just summarized a couple of points that I got before, but but also this idea that of, of drawing the contrast of your not only the particular space in which you work, but but your your intellectual and 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 really cultural and social and political philosophy, that is that these spaces should be open. Right and and bringing that to to your field is is very very exciting for I know for for students and I think drawing a contrast with another space that might say no you know uh, it, we're we're going to sort of stamp you away from this space and and I know people who have had we've talked about this in our in our seminar people who have had difficulty for various reasons uh, Phoenix I think brought this up uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago where certain archival spaces or historic sites will say, you know, you don't have the proper letters of introduction, maybe the proper letters after your name that say you're sort of entitled to these spaces. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and how you, uh, 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 maybe other experiences you've had or heard about in different archives and are there ways to move through that with a proper letter of introduction and the sort of very public, very open archive, very, as opposed to the very closed and very exclusive archive. Um, a, a little bit more about, about what you what you learned about that and uh, what you've encountered in other times. Well, I mean, the the collections that are most exclusive, they rationalize that. And I don't have any reason to not understand, you know, not agree with what they're saying. But their collections are so great that if they let just anyone in, they would be so inundated that they wouldn't be able to manage it. And so that's why they have, you know, this tiered system of who's important enough to use use their stuff. Um, and there there are things to think about in terms of you know, how much use. Does something get before it is no longer usable because it's been physically harmed or something like that? You know, I mean, we have to take into consideration all kinds of you know physical factors on the materials in our collections. Um, you know, light and humidity and and uh, how things are stored and temperature and all those other things. So there there is kind of a preservation conservation side of collections use. Um, we. What we've what we're trying to do, at least at Smiley, in order to make our collections accessible to whoever wants to use them, is for the things that are potentially um, conservation challenges, we're creating a, a digital twin of whatever that item is, and then making that item available for use. So we've done a huge amount of digitizing. Matt did a bunch of digitizing for us when when he was there, but we have entire collections that are only negatives or they're 35 millimeter slides, um, stuff like that. And that's not a format that's particularly useful, but we, we're not going to get rid of it. Um, so creating a format that is, you know, there's a digital interface, researchers can come in, they can find stuff, 
Um, one of the projects that Matt worked on with me was digitizing eight millimeter home movies, which was so cool kind of to see. Now, of course, the, the caveat with, with home movies is you had to be of a position where you could afford to buy the film uh, in order to record what your family was doing, right? So it, it's a very specific portion of a community that is going to be able to get documented through the eight millimeter film. But it certainly gives a slice of what a community looked like, how it interacted with others, what kinds of things they found important. Um, that's a really, it's been a really fun project for us to work on. Um, but ma making these items accessible, and we we bring in every fourth grader in Redlands Unified School District does a history tour that is originally coordinated through the library. Um, and they come to the Lincoln Shrine and all of that so that understanding the sense of place, you know, starting starting that early. Um, this is veering off from what your question is, but because it popped into my mind and I have one of those brains like a sieve, if I don't answer it now, well, um, but there is a really important place for local history. And I think there's, I think we could probably all come up with some academic historians who would not see value or at least a commensurate value um, with local or regional history. But there is a huge benefit because I think that if, if people can understand the history of the community in which they live and they can see themselves as part of that history, then they are more likely to be contributing members of that community. Um, to get involved in things, you know, if, as, as long as there's that connection, um, then it sounds sounds silly, but they're going to be better citizens. It's, and so th th that's the kind of thing that, that doesn't often get talked about um, in terms of the roles that, that local and regional history can play in the life of a community. Um, it's not just the blue hair is sitting around a historical society meeting. It's, we go out and give presentations to any group that asks um, to bring those stories out because we know then that they will contribute back. Um, we've been doing a lot of outreach with some of the other um, components in the community. There's been a, the, uh, there's a series of um, Mexican American neighborhoods in the north, northwest, north section of Redlands that have been traditionally underserved. We're trying to make sure we can reach out to capture their stories. Um, you know, you can't sit around waiting for people to come to you because then they, they won't. So we're, we're trying to do that, that kind of outreach. We've participated in a um, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez Day um, event last spring. We're looking to do that again. We've been active with Juneteenth things in Redlands. I was um, part of the group that made recommendations to the city council to name a park after one of our important early African-American pioneers in Redlands. Came in, came to the San Marino Valley in the 1870s. It was pretty cool. So we have Israel Beale Park now. Um, the local history stuff, you know, touches all kinds of different parts. And it's it's not just the mansions, right? Or the stuff. That's, again, that's way off. You were, you were asking about the difference between the elitist institutions and the open. So I actually, I think it does fit yeah. with, with uh, the accessibility thing, the connectivity. Yeah, um, I definitely think it does. And, and, and I think that, that, like you said, there is a tendency toward um, a certain narrow definition of what it is we do within the academy. Um, and and I, again, thanks to our particular department's um, brilliant crew. And of course, you know, you know, Ryan, but Tom and Daisy and, and, and Mark and Diana and others who, who do this, this kind of local uh, connected work and uh, Tiffany Jones who worked with the, um, was that the, the, the name of the mental hospital, the regional mental hospital? Patton. Patton, that's right. Uh, she did a major project with them. Sherston Lyon before she headed up to Oregon was uh, doing lots of work with yeah. Riverside and Chinatown there. Um, it's it's really exciting. And, and I think, um, I think not not respecting those sort of disciplinary, um, you know, contests and uh, that that sort of protectiveness or defensiveness about what the discipline is 
is exciting, sort of challenging those ideas, knocking them down, and then and maybe finding that that there's not really a there there, right? And so so our sort of idea of an elitist professor may be a little bit of a myth because when you get to know some of these people, you realize that they all also have um, ha once the actual encounter happens, right? Once the meeting happens, you re recognize that you have a lot of shared shared interests. But yeah, that sort of professional defensiveness. Um, comes from maybe a deep insecurity of, of, of intellectuals, you know, sure. <laughs> who all are a little bit worried that people are going to come under their territory, you know, that, that's that's a that's a sort of um, occupational hazard that comes from too many, maybe, oh, anyway, long, long story, a little close to the bone, but that, that, <laughs> that sort of idea of, of sort of getting smacked down in certain situations and then, you know, working up until you're the person who's sort of doing the, the smacking down, that, that kind of co ultra competitiveness within certain realms of academic sure. studies can be uh, yeah, it can be pretty toxic and can lead to that kind of combativeness or defensiveness. And, and I, I like that we're talking about it because it is important at this stage, uh, whether as an undergrad or as an MA student, to really think about it. And some of our crew are, are thinking, are looking at PhD programs and thinking seriously about PhD programs. Um, and that's pretty neat how you did yours, how you found your, your, your unique path there, your distinctive path there. Unique indeed. Two two years to write a dissertation. <laughs> that is not uh, that is not standard operating procedure. Um, but but really neat to see what is possible when you have the kind of guidance and the kind of plan and also the openness to to improvisation and uh, a mix of improvisation and structure. A really exciting mix. I think it's really cool. Really really neat. Yeah, um, I think um, unless there's like. There's one one question about bilingual staff. Uh, Jean Martinez asked there. We do. Yeah. Yeah. My colleague uh, Maria Creo Colado is uh, is totally bilingual, and she does great stuff for us to make make uh, our materials accessible to those who may have may not speak English as a first language. Um, it, it's a my dad's parents spoke Spanish to each other at home. That was their their first language. But my dad grew up in the years following the Second World War when they were trying to be American, right? And so they never taught my dad Spanish. And so even though I'm Mexican American, I was also in high school sort of rebelling against my grandfather. He was a very typical kind of machismo person. So I took German. Huh. <laughs> Not real smart living in Southern California. I, sh I should have taken Spanish. But yes, we do have bilingual, bilingual staff. Thanks. And, uh, and that is, I mean, yeah, it is, it is neat, it's a, a really cool perspective that you have on it. Very distinctive local, um, very distinctive local local perspective on that. Um, you know, in terms of the, if I can just jump over, because I know we, at some point you have another section of this <laughs> that you would like to get rid of me for. Um, but in terms of the things that, that I wish I had known or learned about, when I was in either undergraduate or graduate school in preparing for a career as an historian outside the academy. And especially for those who are thinking about like museum work potentially, there are thousands of museums across the country and the vast majority of them are very small, which means that they have small staffs. And you know, you go to, a major institution, we can all think of a major institution, and they're going to have an executive director, and they're probably going to have a, a person whose only job is fundraising, or maybe a whole staff that only does fundraising. You're going to have curatorial staff. You're going to have conservation staff. You probably have an education um, coordinator for the educational programs and things like that. It's great to be able to specialize like that. Um, but one of the exciting things about being in a small institution is you get to do a little of a lot of different things. So coming into a role like once uh, when I started at, at Smiley Library is I didn't have any background in fundraising at all, but that is a huge and important component to any small, any institution, because even, even institutions that are at least partially tax funded still need more money. Um, so that money, you know, you have people who support your mission if you have a good mission. Uh, and then generally, if they have means, they're willing to contribute. So learning more about 
the kind of intricacy of fundraising would have been helpful coming in. Um, so the class that I teach at Redlands, I, I think, be, Matt, because we got split up in the early days of COVID, I think yes. we didn't end up doing the fundraising week because right. uh, it was at the end of the semester then. But we will at least have, and it's the undergraduate public history class, we will have one, one class period that's just talking about fundraising, things like that. Um, I didn't have any like kind of budget experience that's all been on the job stuff and that kind of just basic understanding maybe like a school of business kind of class would have been useful as part of a program training historians to go out into the world um some of the kind of that practical side and then <laughs> this was just fortunate for me um i spent all four years of my undergraduate experience i had a work study job working in the scene shop of the theater department which means that every time they had to build a set for a play, I got to help build the set. And I got to work with electronics, doing sound and all the technical sides of history. A museum is a theater. Uh, it's just a little bit different, but it's all about creating an experience, right? Teaching you something or instructing in some way. And those skills that I learned totally outside the classroom have been of huge benefit to me in understanding, you know, how, how to set up an exhibit uh, or an exhibition. You know, how do you move people through? How do you build the walls that go in the gallery and put the stuff in? How do you move your lighting around so that you have some kind of important dramatic effect that at the same time then on with the other history hat on is appropriate in terms of conservation of the things that are being exhibited? You know, how do you make these experiences? How do you choose the colors and and all of that? It's it's been an interesting. And there isn't really um I didn't have the benefit of some kind of like exhibition design class. I think that could have been a cool thing to have learned more about um, for me. So there, there are these other sort of ancillary things that when you get into a job are are helpful to have learned about, but most of us don't come out of our programs with that kind of practical stuff. That's, th those are really, really concrete. And wouldn't we all like to be masters of fundraising? Wouldn't we, <laughs> that, I, I would love to take that class, that, that, one, that one class that you're gonna teach, because we, we, we do think about that a lot. And, and I'm sure the kind of mindset that you bring to fundraising is similar to the mindset that you bring to writing a grant or something like that, you know, that, that sort of approach. But picking that up and, and yeah, taking an accounting or, or a, finance class or something like that. I think we do have a an exhibit design cool. class here, which is great. And we have um, interactions that some of you guys know with the anthro department and the Anthro Anthropology Museum on the third floor. And if you're available at some other point in the year, you can come over and, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hand you off to one of our experts who works <laughs> in the third floor Anthropology Museum. Uh, but then also uh, uh, Dr. Kate Liska and the Raffman Museum, yeah. really fascinating. It's a really impressive Egypt collection, um, but but that that side of sort of exhibit design uh, they do they do talk a little bit about. I like that that um, that theater comparison. And again, again, this is this is it's something that I really strongly agree with and endorse is this idea of being attuned to picking up skills that you don't expect will be appropriate and or not appropriate but but you don't expect to be maybe applicable to the path that you're that you're going on and that level of flexibility and resourcefulness um in addition to working hard on your narrowly defined program right being open to these different things i think it's a really 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 important thing uh, for for you guys to hear uh uh from dr gonzalez it's a it's a really really important aspect of being at your stage as either BA or MA students, being attuned to picking up um, picking up opportunities and and new skills. Yeah, picking sets in a in a theater department. Um, and and then the, the applicability of that to 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 designing a, a space. Um, and and of course, you know any any kind of accounting experience that you that you pick up, any kind of fundraising experience is going to be very applicable in a number of circumstances. So I, I think that's that's a um, a lot. The other last thing I, I, I want to just amplify that you said is patience. Um, and although on the one hand you did this uh, this remarkably 
um, uh, um, speedy uh, PhD dissertation. Also, it's not going to win a Pulitzer, trust me. What? <laughs> you know, you, you pass with Professor Trapster, that, that's got to be dynamite. But if you, if you um, first met about the Museum of Redlands in 2000, yeah. And the museum is going to become a reality. And watch this space, guys, and so so that you can check out the Museum of Redlands for uh, for an internship and for gigs and all kinds of stuff. If it's going to open in 2024, that is 24 years in the making. Um, and so I think it's another thing that bears sort of amplifying to you all, and that is the patience and 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 sticking to you know long term projects, whether it's at at the local level or or at a state or national historic site or that kind of thing. But but watching these projects come to fruition is a really exciting thing as well. It also applies to writing projects. Um, unless it, unless it's just a two year dissertation, uh, you know, writing this this is another thing that bears mentioning to students um, is that really powerful, meaningful. Or projects of creation, whether they're museums or writing projects or whatever, do reward patience. They they really really do. Um, and exciting things happen while you know everything else in in your in your life is happening. Um, and Danielle said, "No, go to the San Bernardino County Museum. We're the best." Ah, I see a rivalry emerging here. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, I'll paste one more time for uh, for everybody our document. We are going to have some of and and maybe these are uh, these are friends of yours. Uh, Nathan, but on, let's see, Daniela is going to help us organize a museum work session um, that's going to be on uh, April 3rd with Jennifer Dickerson, who's a museum curator at the San Bernardino County Museum, and then her colleague, Sarah uh, Bercado, and also Michael Chavez, a graduate of our CSUSB MA and BA programs, who is now at the Fowler and UCLA. So we're going to have, we do have another uh, um, I'll share actually for everybody's uh, benefit so you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, but that's going to be here. Uh, so Daniela is is uh, uh, flagging her upcoming event and her her colleagues. She's working over there. Um, and Ben, do you, are you familiar with the, with these folks over at the, the County Museum? It's it, this is really uh, nice, and I, and I like the 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 that, that we have these three really exciting events. One on a state and historic sites, state parks and historic sites next week. Um, Daniela's event that she noted uh, in a few weeks on April 3rd, uh, but also uh, today's uh, today's kickoff event, which uh, has been really, really cool. I'm I'm so excited that you guys had a chance to hear from this. I'm really grateful to Dr. Gonzalez for, for joining us. I want to give one more chance for questions, for, for comments, um, for, for any thoughts, any feedback from you all. Um, I I, uh, I expect you're going to know how to, how to get a hold of Dr. Gonzalez after this. If you feel um, I'm pretty easy to find, you're welcome to put my email in the chat or whatever. Thanks. I'll I'll share this with. I'll, I don't have it handy, but I'll share it with the crew with a, with a, this MA crew after uh, after the event. And um, uh, yeah, I don't want to put it on that sort of public facing document. <laughs> I get you know, but but I will I will share it with the MA students. Um, and and uh, I am sort of vamping here uh, if, while, while you guys are thinking, if you have any sort of last minute uh, questions, and we'll aim to wrap up in just a couple minutes. And I also want to give Dr. Gonzalez a chance for, for any, any closing thoughts. Uh, but I like those sort of what I wish I'd known uh, mm -hmm. kind of things, picking up skills uh, and that kind of thing. Um, I don't see, oh, I do see one hand. Rosandra, thank you. Uh, jump in, please. You should be unmuted, but I can't hear you. I don't hear you. It looks like you're unmuted. Is it better now? Can you hear me now? Yes. We got you, yep. Sorry, I think my headphones are pretty whack. Okay. Hello, Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you for coming and very exciting. I was wondering how your experience was when you were preparing for your PhD, because we have like we have to figure out this thesis project and there's a lot of pressure on this because this is like our entire lives <laughs> based on it's like focused on this piece of paper and you were ready like when those opportunities came so i'm just wondering does it matter like what you do on paper if you're personable like how do you develop all of these tools 
so you're prepared when those opportunities come. Yeah, I was really fortunate that I've been surrounded by good mentors. Um, and that has made all of the difference uh, in learning. So the Larry Burgess was the director of the library. He was also in the graduate program. And he helped me understand a lot um, as I was gearing toward, toward the dissertation and, you know, figure out, well, have you thought about these sources or, you know, you know have you looked at this institution kind of thing? And, and Cliff, Cliff was great with that too. And so I had a really supportive committee um, and that would, that made a huge difference with that. And then the, the added advantage of being able to, to have it selected a topic that was regional, Southern California, but also that was part of my own in, home institution's collecting field. Um, so I was able to make use of the collections that I was already working with every day in order to have supporting evidence for the um, arguments that I was making. Um, so that was a real benefit. And then I mean, I lived alone with my cats. So <laughs> that was an added benefit of being able to, after a long day at work, come home and then be able to focus on either um, the research materials that I had uh, had um, discovered and then being able to synthesize that and and then do the writing. And for me, the, the research part is the fun part, not the writing part, um, because it's the, the excitement of discovery as you go through. But then having to, because you want to then tell every story, um, but of course you can't, you got to be focused and figure out, okay, which pieces of evidence are the most important to, to um, support whatever the thesis is, um, and then getting that onto the paper. And, and my, my own um, kind of method for writing is I tend to, I am a little OCD. <laughs> so I said I was an OCD in terms of like organizing stuff, but I have an internal dialogue that doesn't stop, which is really annoying. But it's really helpful when I'm trying to write something because I write it over and over and over and over again in my head and before I write it on the paper and then sit down at the computer. And then, you know, it, it's a first draft, obviously, but it comes out because I've thought about all these things ad nauseum. Um, then it comes out on the paper and then I finally have something to work with that I can tweak and, and figure out what, um, how, how, to best, how to best present something. So, so that's an annoying thing, but every once in a while I can use it to my advantage. I do think we, we might have gotten the secret to a two-year dissertation, and that is having only, uh, having, having a, a, a cats for roommates, <laughs> no distraction. But, uh, but at the same time, I do, I do really want to say also that that point of, of having, um, th this is important for, for, for the writing process, and this is something I, I agree with and, and, and want to just note as well. And that is being busy with a subject all the time um, and, and having the good fortune of it being your place of work right. and your, your sort of this, this other intellectual space that you're, you're occupying as a, as a creator of knowledge, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an author. Um, and and that, that overlap allows you to really be busy with that just constantly. And mm -hmm. that's exciting. But I do want to urge you guys to also be, be busy with your topics when you're, once you commit to it. Um, you can be, you can have a million things going on, but also always have, uh, whether, you know, wh whatever it is, have a, have a notepad in your pocket or, or a notes app or something like that, or text yourself or email yourself or do whatever it is to, to really always be cooking on an idea. So whether it's that intensive internal dialogue or, or simply, uh, being ready to write the first paragraph when you sit down, um, that's, that's an exciting way to write. And, and I, I think really the best way to write there's no then there are no blocks because you're you're ready for that first paragraph to start you rolling to start well, I heard somebody refer to that as parking on a downhill uh when you when you when you finish uh, always leave with something lively uh stop your writing session with something you're excited about park on a downhill so that you're ready to you can pop start your car on the way you know on the way going through uh Danielle uh you're going to jump in please uh go ahead Oh, can you uh, unmute there? Yeah, now I can. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. I, um, Dr. Gonzalez, pleasure to meet you. Um, my question is, what advice can you give, like, 
first year gra graduate students, undergrad students to, you know, get on the path that they want to get on? Because I know there's a few of us that are still struggling with where they want to be or what they want to do. So like how, like what kind of advice can you give them or us? <laughs> I would say as best as you can be a sponge mm -hmm. and take in as many different kinds of experiences within the arena that you're studying as you can, because at some point something will click. And if you, if you have the openness to kind of consider all kinds of things, I think that will really help because um, then it's not forced. If you're trying to force something, it doesn't always have the best outcome. But if you can just be open to all kinds of different things, then I think you'll have a much better chance of saying, that's what it is, that's what I want to do. Um, but get out there and get experiences. I mean, are you talking, you mean like with, within the, the academic program, finding a focus or like trying to figure out what you're going to, to go to after you finish? Um, well, of from what I've heard, like when we have discussions and stuff like that, or, or like outside personal life, um, we've had discussions about like, it's unsure where we want to go after or how we're going to, you know, move on after, you know, because we have all these opportunities with, you know, internships and stuff like that, but actually having a position is kind of difficult. So that's why it's like, like, you know, in a sense, it kind of questions our ability you know, of our, you know, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like a lot, I feel like sometimes, you know, me personally, before I got my position at the County Museum as a curatorial assistant, I questioned myself of really what I wanted to do with the history, with this, you know, with the public history degree. Mm -hmm. And um, now that I'm in there, I, like you said, I began to, you know, become open and take more, um, techniques become more versatile in a sense, but others, I feel like, you know, are still in limbo of what actually they want to do. That's why, like, you know, it doesn't have to be academically. It could also be like in the real world as well. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the great benefits of this series is the exposure to all these different kinds of potential career paths that are out there. Because I mean, I know when I finished my undergraduate degree, I didn't have a clue how many different opportunities there are for, for people who are interested in, in history out there. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's really dramatic, actually, um, all, yeah. all the different things. And your, your answer was a little bit in there, Daniela, that, that, that is being versatile. And that's what Dr. Mm -hmm. Gonzalez emphasized as well, being a sponge. Like you said being versatile. And so being... Also, I, I, I love this theme that Dr. Gonzalez keeps coming back to of being, being really diligent and, and sort of fiercely committed to your program of study and being attuned to possible other opportunities, exciting things, and being ready, you know, if, if, they, if they do come up. So that flexibility, in addition to, in addition to a really fierce commitment to the, 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 the tasks that are in front of you, um, the, the, the seminars that you're taking uh, and, you know, everything else that, 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 that is in front of you in terms of your, your, your requirements, but also that, that flexibility. I, I really like that. Um, uh, and, and the, you know, identifying crucial mentors like you have at the, at the museum um, and you'll, you'll pick up here in, in, um, in your work and specifically to the MA students. I just want to note um, that uh, this, is especially to the first year MA students, that is, the culminating project that you choose can also be curated to, as a launch pad for what's going to happen next, right? So there is the portfolio, the, 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 the project, and the, the so-called, I don't want to call it traditional, but the thesis option, um, the thesis portfolio or project option, whichever of those three you choose should be designed with your mentors and, and with me, um, with your next steps in mind. So that you're basically designing your own launch pad that's going to send you into um, into whatever comes next. Not sort of the check the boxes project that says, okay, I did it, I got my my MA, but actually something that is open-ended. That's the sort of lifelong learning kind of approach where you're going to stay committed to this project, you know, 
forever, you know, for, 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 for a long, long time. Um, and that, that flexibility, that, uh, you know, um, uh, identification of mentors, and of course, that, that intense diligence uh, and, and really, really hard work at the task that's right in front of you. Those things are going to are going to deliver your your opportunities. They did certainly did productive. Can I give you an, an example of? Yeah. So it's winter quarter of of ninety nine, and I'm taking this two quarter research seminar, and I have no idea what it is I want to research, and then end up writing. Um, but I was already working at this project in Riverside, um, and I was organizing this collection of of um, correspondence from um, Mission Inn. So it was Frank Miller who created Mission Inn, um, his business correspondence. And I'm going through these papers, you know, because that's what you do as an archivist, trying to figure out how to organize it and what, what is there. And I came across a letter that was written to Frank Miller by Collis P. Huntington of the big four railroad people. And I thought, why on earth is C.P. Huntington writing to Frank Miller, and that caused a spark of curiosity. And so as I was working with this collection then, anytime there was something that seemed to be related to this, um, I made a note of it. And eventually then what I realized was going on is Frank Miller was trying to get um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs to create an Indian Native American a boarding school for Native peoples in Riverside. And he was working all kinds of different angles to try to get this. Now, remember, he's just created this Spanish fantasy past hotel, um, mission past hotel. Uh, and why then is he working on this big campaign to try to bring an, an Indian boarding school? And realize eventually that it's because of the tourist value of having Indians in a school, all the buildings he helps design. Oh, and by the way, they sold his sister sold them the property. And it happens to be at the end of the streetcar line that he owns a majority share in, or he and his friends together own this majority share. And they create a park next door that's a destination. And all the buildings are done in Mission Revival. And oh, by the way, Helen Hunt Jackson's book, Ramona, a story which came out in the 1880s, propelled this sort of mission era uh, and Native peoples in the imagination of Americans across the country in this best-selling novel, um, bringing all kinds of people to Southern California to, to visit the sites of the book kind of thing. Um, suddenly there was a story there, and it was a story that hadn't been told. Um, and it was from, from that one moment of discovery and inquisitiveness on a letter that launched what ended up being my entire dissertation. Because what I then focused on as a result was what I called ethnotourism in Southern California, which is the creation of tourist attractions which package or repackage uh, ethnic minorities in a way that is safe and sellable to dominant class people. Um, but it was all from one one letter that I happened upon totally by accident. That's excellent. And and that that kind of yeah, that kind of attuned uh attuneness, being attuned to those 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 opportunities. That's I, I actually do that I, I find similar things in the Han Chinese dominant mode of sort of ethno tourism as well. That's sort of what's safe what's safe ethnic identities. And, yeah. and of course, there's a lot of violence in that, the violence stamping out of what is considered not safe. So right. not safe. Um, that's, that's, that's fascinating. And that's a good tease for the, for the dissertation, which I'm sure we can find online. Probably. <laughs> there's right. a copy of it in the, in the Smiley Library. Very cool. It's one of the UCR library, I'm sure. <laughs> that's excellent, Nathan. Thank you so much. I, I do want to uh, give one more chance for any, um, any questions. From our crew, uh, as I said, if you uh, if you can't find Dr. Gonzalez's email quickly, you can email me, and I will forward the question on for anybody who who, who doesn't want to ask questions right now. But thanks to everybody who did, and thanks to all you guys who, for joining us. 
Thanks to those who aren't in uh, in the, the, the MA seminar, um, Jay and Cynthia and Gustavo and Patricia and Daniel and Jean. Uh, it's great to see some of you guys, some of your familiar faces, some I saw this morning in class. So thanks, uh, uh, Gustavo and, and, and you guys for joining. Nice to see you online, Jean. Um, thanks, everybody. This is this has been really, really fantastic. And, and Nathan, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, just that please call me Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, history is a fantastic and broad field, and there's so many different different ways that you can be a historian and still make a living and make a contribution. Um, so I wish everybody the best. I'm super accessible. I, I'm at Smiley Library at least five days a week. Um, our public hours are 10 to 12, 1 to 5. I'm always accessible by email. Um, you can find me through the college district too. So I'm I'm pretty, pretty easy to find and, and I try to be as accessible as I can. Thank you, Nathan. And that's a, that's a perfect note to sound at the end of the first in these uh, in, in the series of events. Um, that's, a, that's a really, really great point to, to wrap up with. Uh, so thanks from uh, from Rosandra there. Um, uh, this was reassuring and honest. Absolutely. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. And and uh, Jean said, really enjoyed this. Cynthia, thank you, Professor Murray and Professor Gonzalez um, and Gustavo. Uh, it's nice to see you. And thank you to Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you all for, for joining us. Please join me in giving a, a, Dr. Gonzalez, giving Nathan a, 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 a round of applause. Thank you so much for joining. I'm glad this worked out because this is spring yeah. break at U of R. Oh, great. So my class meets Monday nights, but because it's spring break, I'm able to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I am going 